It's October 26, 2016, and Clockwork Empires is officially launching, after two years in early access and a closed development period before that. So if you're watching this video now, chances are you're wondering what kind of game Clockwork Empires is, and whether or not it's something you might consider acquiring. Uh, the best way for me to show you that is to tell you about how the game plays, you know, the sort of game it is, and show you how it plays. Uh, so I'll have some gameplay footage in here, and uh, the rest will just be me rambling on about the game. So first things first, who are Gaslamp Games? Well, they're a small indie development studio, they're based in British Columbia, Canada, and they're probably best known for their previous game, uh, Dungeons of Dreadmore. Um, a very well-received game that is generally considered uh, one of the forerunners of the current uh, roguelike resurgence. Uh, the game's really good. Just check it out. And on the basis of that game alone, you may consider at least investigating Clockwork Empires. So what sort of game is Clockwork Empires? Well, simply put, it's a colony simulator, uh, but to call it a colony simulator is a little bit simplistic. It shares kind of idea space with RimWorld, Dwarf Fortress, Banished, uh, the Anno games from Ubisoft, and somewhere back in his family tree there's Pharaoh and Caesar. So all those sorts of resource management, uh, production chain, supply line type games. So what distinguishes Clockwork Empires from similar colony builders in its genre? Well, I think it comes down to a couple of categories, setting and also personalities. So I'll touch, on, touch upon each of those in turn. Clockwork Empires is set in an alternate history of Victorian era world, where the two driving forces of the empire were industrialization and colonization. As befits the steampunk setting, there are all manner of fanciful gadgets and mechanisms for the ease and comfort of your colonists. Things that are run by steam or clockwork or coal. Uh, fanciful things like steam knights and uh, you know, ray guns named laden pistols. Uh, all that sort of thing. The setting also allows for all sorts of fanciful Britishisms. Uh, things like red coats, pith helmets, monocles, handlebar mustaches, men and women with funny names and blatant disregard for human life in the name of industry. As Colonial Overseer, the player is tasked with settling untamed wilderness and then uh, directing its growth uh, so that it thrives. You'll start off with a minimum of resources and manpower, and you'll accumulate increased resources through uh, forestry and mining and farming, and you'll build machines, and you'll accumulate a military, uh, all on your way to making a thriving colony for the greater glory of the Empire. This won't be easy, and until you've had some experience running a colony, your early efforts may well end in a spiral of starvation or madness or despair um, all on its own, as your colony collapses under its own weight. In addition to internal pressures, of course, there are external threats. Um, conventional ones, like bandits, uh, just unaligned ruffians. Also foreign nationals, who may actually be your allies, or your worst enemies, um, and th these come in the form of the Novorus, the uh, Republic Mechanique, and the Stalmark, stand-ins for Russia, France, and Germany, respectively. In addition to conventional threats, however, you're faced with hazards of a more eldritch nature. The first ones you're likely to encounter are the fish people, uh, scaly, monstrous humanoids who you can deal with as you wish. You can take an aggressive tack, or perhaps a peaceful negotiation. In addition to the fish people, though, you'll also face threats of a more otherworldly nature, as you'll occasionally stumble across sleeping obelescians, who, as their name suggests, are stony black creatures with a weird number of eyes and tentacles and inscrutable motives. You'll also encounter Starspawn, uh, who spawn from meteorites, which impact your map. Um, yeah, you'll have fun dealing with them. Another existential threat to your colony comes in the form of cults, 
star-worshipping weirdos who are drawn from the ranks of your colonists. Um, but that's better dealt with in the personality section. One thing that I feel sets Clockwork Empires apart from uh, other similar games is the depth of its personality system. Each colonist is afforded his or her own uh, set of memories and attributes and uh, proficiencies. Certain colonists may be better at certain areas, uh, they may have better or more, pro more appropriate skills for certain tasks than others, and it's your responsibility as overseer to see that they're assigned uh, to where they can do the most good. Each colonist has his or her own personality, and colonists will talk to each other. They'll form memories, they will act on their impulses, and their outlook, whether their, uh, their emotions, uh, are influenced by their memories and personalities. Uh, so your population is always dynamically reacting to itself, and of course also to the threats of uh, hostile outsiders, whatever form that might take. And all of this influences the productivity of your colony. colony. If your uh, military NCO falls into deep despair and refuses to protect the colony, well, that has serious repercussions the next time bandits come to raid your stores. If your colonists can't get along with each other and they become furiously angry, they may break things by kicking them or doing other things to relieve their anger. If they sleep poorly because you haven't built cots, uh, again, they may become sad. This affects their happiness. Happy colonists are willing to work longer hours. So the better you're able to provide for the emotional states of your colonists, uh, the better your colony will run. If you'll indulge me for a moment, I'm going to speak a little bit about my personal relationship with Clockwork Empires. Uh, now, I'm not any kind of professional reviewer or journalist. Uh, I do this as a hobby. I'm not affiliated with Gaslamp Games in any way. I'm not an employee. Uh, I've just been following the development of this game uh, since before Early Access because game development... the development of this particular game is fascinating. The developers have had this awesome blog where they talk about development hurdles and design choices and artistic decisions, and it's super interesting. And on the basis of that, I bought into Early Access, I've been reading the blogs, I've been contributing bugs and feedback and suggestions. Um, yeah, it's been great. However, on that basis, of course, uh, by no means would I consider myself an impartial observer. So I'm not going to tell you the game is good, the game is bad. Uh, I'll just show you what the game is like and you can decide for yourselves. However, if you look at my YouTube history and the channel that I posted this on, you can see that I've been doing these monthly looks at Clockwork Empires for about the same period, like oh, almost two years. Um, so you can trust, at the very least, that I know what I'm talking about when I talk about what the game is like mechanically, or flow, or uh, production chains, or game objectives. Um, yeah, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Please, please make up your own minds. Alright, so here's the part of the video where I narrate uh, what I'm doing live, and uh, maybe I can talk you through my thought process as I build and plan out modules. So this is something I did regularly, uh, with the monthly stable releases of uh, while the game was in early access, and it's something I can intend to continue doing um, post-launch. Um, I hope that there will be a bunch of new players entering the game who are going to want some instruction as to um, you know production chains and how things get done and uh, where to build a particular module and stuff like that. And I think that's something uh, I think I'm able to instruct people. Uh, in such a way that they'll, you know, they'll enjoy their game. Or at least they'll understand it, you know. Um, let's take a look here. So, what does this little question mark mean? So, this building here is the kitchen, and Cecil Bronze Crimble is the overseer I assigned to do to be my colony chef, basically. This other dude here is a worker underneath him. So Cecil is an overseer. If we pull up the overseer list on the side here, See, this is the representation of his crew. He's got um, this guy who just made a farmer stew. And these blank spots are where I can put additional workers. Now, I've assigned all the workers I have. When I get new ones, 
they'll appear up here in the unassigned pool and then I put them in whichever uh, whichever work crew um, I want to uh, to have laborers in. Cecil's just hanging around because I guess there's nothing the kitchen is currently fulfilling all the orders I've set it to. So I set assignments on a per module basis. So there are two small stone ovens here and there's a standing order for 13 fungus stew from this first oven and eight farmers stew from the second oven. Um, it's, I'll probably just gloss over it for now, but those different types of foods have different types of attributes. And if you can make the right kind of food that your colony wants, they'll be happy. Um, let's take a look at the population summary, for instance. So these long orange bars are overseers and these shorter beige bars are workers who work uh, under the authority of the overseers. Now this emotion icon here is just a on the far right is just a quick summary of how these colonists are feeling. As you can see they're split about half and half between sadness and happiness which is much better than um, at the start of this video when most of them were sad. So I've been working toward making them happy. Oh I'll just go back there for a second. If we mouse over them you'll see in the bottom right there's a summary of their emotions. At a glance I can see what is the thing that is making most of them sad? In this case, the quality of the food. Well, admittedly, it could be better, um, but this colony is just starting out. I, you know, I'm gearing up. I'm getting food production up to speed. Let's take a look at one of our colonists here, Stanley Weed, common laborer, not an overseer. We can see these are his most recent memories, or things he can. Uh, sorry, this box in the middle are his most recent memories, all of which influences his emotional state, you can see that each recent memory contributes to one of these four emotions. Um, for instance, he gossiped recently with another colonist, which made him happy, but also more fearful, or no, reduced his fear. He slept well because he had a bed. Uh, that's not true of everyone because I've only got six beds for my 13 colonists and they're common beds, which means the overseers are not happy to sleep in them. Um, yeah, let's, okay, let's take a look at Precia Crank. Oh, no, Bruce Biscuit, who works under Precia Crank. So, again, he's got memories in the middle. These are his recent memories, and the new ones displace the old ones, so the old ones scroll off the bottom, and uh, the memories that influence his emotional state are updated every time he has a new memory. That, in turn, influences current um, emotional state. As you can see, despair is the predominant emotion which makes him a sad panda. Uh, but we can see all the contributing factors to what's making him uh, happy, sad, angry, or fearful. Someone who is excessively angry or fearful uh, is prone to do weird and antisocial things. Um, these six, uh, uh, five things here are the things that contribute most strongly to um, his feelings on the colony. Uh, and these fall under the category quality of life. Above them, we see traits. So every personnel, uh, every colonist has different traits. In this case, he is hail and hearty and pioneering spirit, both of which um, contribute to his affinities in different ways. Hail and hearty means he heals faster and he's healthier generally. And pioneering spirit means he, uh, in this case, I believe it means he likes woodworking. Take a look at Sewell Rutabaga. See about his fancy red coat that he's actually part of my military. Uh, again, he's a sad person. He's got different traits. He likes laudanum, which um, is a good that the colony can make, although I don't have the facilities to do so. I, I need to set up like a chemist's lab and a glass works uh, and all those sorts of things. He also has pioneering spirit and he has the easily influenced trait, uh, which means he he's a joiner. He likes to join organizations, whether they are for good or for ill. He's easily swayed. And this comes up. There are so one thing that game benefits from is decision trees. There are never any strictly good or bad decisions, just choices that unlock other choices. Um, for instance, you sometimes have the option to accept smuggled goods. This makes your law-abiding citizens um, less happy, but it makes your less law-abiding citizens more happy. And often this sparks an investigation from the home countries. However, you can often forestall those investigations uh, if you placate the reporting colonist, who is typically one of your citizens here. 
if he's um, Mr. Sewell, or Sewell Rutabaga, for instance, because he has the easily influenced trait, he'll typically just be happy with however you instruct him. Another colonist not so easily influenced might actually become upset if you decide not to let him investigate. Okay, I direct your attention to the far right. This is a spontaneous event. So a great variety of these will pop up uh, periodically when you play. In this case, um, there are unnatural sounds from the night. Uh, but they're held at bay by the glimmer of the settlement lights. So I believe what that means is that because I have an established military of a certain size, in this case, two people, um, I was able to fend off the negative effects of uh, that event. Events come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. The meteor, the meteor crash event is one such random event. Uh, again, the Obelescan invasions, fish people visits, bandits, that's a pretty frequent event you may see occasionally. Um, sort of beetle beetle rampages. Those are some of my favorite. Um, it's a little too in-depth to go into for this kind of introductory video, but I hope I've been able to give you sort of a taste of what gameplay is like. What I intend to do is I intend to uh, follow up this video with a more uh, a more deliberate step-by-step -step type video for people uh, trying to set up a colony for the first time or trying to understand um, just how to play. And in combination with this video, perhaps, it'll give people a good idea if this is the sort of game they want to play. Um, obviously, I do. That's what I think, since I've stuck with it for years now. Um, and hopefully I can communicate, you know, the appeal it has for me, uh, for you. This is my stockpile, by the way, where random things get put. Now, I mean, I'm nowhere near capacity, but if I need more space, I can just stamp down another one. Let's take a look at resources. Got a reasonable amount of logs. Uh, we're running a little bit short on stone, so I'm going to, as a standing job, I'm going to designate these stones for quarrying, and then they get moved. They get pickaxed, and then they get hauled into the stockpile. And once they're in the stockpile, uh, anyone who invokes or any work crew that takes up a job requiring stone blocks can retrieve them from the stockpile. This building I'm constructing up here at the top of the colony. I was going to say top left, but of course you can rotate, so, you know. Um, this building here is the br uh, the pub, a social building, where colonists can go and relieve themselves. That sounds wrong. Um, they can have a drink, kick back, and find some relief. Uh, if, this will help placate your angry colonists and cheer up your sad colonists. Of course it requires you the ability to make booze which is this module I built here in the kitchen. This is the booze vat. Now it's not doing anything right now, which is what the question mark means. I can queue up. Um, because I'm growing corn, I have the ability to brew chicha, an alcoholic beverage made out of corn. Let's do that right now. So this would normally just be a one-off, say make five vats, uh, five bottles of chicha, but I can change the job type to a standing order, which means the kitchen will attempt to maintain at all times a certain amount of that good in the stockpile. In this case, five. So whenever someone in the kitchen notices there are fewer than five bottles in the stockpile, they'll try and grab corn out of the stockpile, brew it into booze, and then deposit it back in the stockpile. Now that might not be possible because I've only got one corn field, which produces a certain amount of corn, and the productivity of crops and efficiency is another, it's another topic altogether maybe something I can get into later. The point is though, booze, it might not be possible to make booze, and that is because I've also queued up um, a minimum order of farmer's stew, which is uh, a high quality food made out of vegetables, and, this, and the only vegetable I have is corn. So I've got stew and booze both competing, um, sorry, no, I've got stew and booze both competing for my limited pre, uh, amounts of corn. And if I was really serious about it, I might consider planting another field. Farms. Uh, another topic for another day. You can see that um, the ones I'm not able to plant are grayed out, uh, which is weird because I, of course, I successfully planted this cornfield. Maybe the game's telling me I don't have enough 
workers. Yes, so the workplace cost. I actually don't have enough uh, overseers to staff the increased fields. So ordinarily, corn would not be grayed out um, if it was available to build. Of course, it's not right now, so it's grayed out. But these are the varieties of crops I can plant. I can unlock more varieties, more crop varieties, by researching them at science facilities, which are way down the development tree. Um, you'll notice I don't have any metalsmithing uh, facilities, for instance, or the ability to make glass, that sort of thing. All of that comes later. All of which I hope I can demonstrate for you in maybe the episodes to come. Um, but maybe I'll leave this one here for now, uh, in the interests of keeping this video tidy. So for those of you considering purchasing Clockwork Empires, thanks for watching this video. I would encourage you perhaps to watch the follow-up video as well. Um, actually, I'm going to post a link. I also made a summary video of you know what is Clockwork Empires on the uh, occasion of the game entering beta, which was back in, I believe, May of 2016. Um, yeah, so feel free to check that one out as well. Uh, otherwise... I hope you found this video informative. My name is Alfred. Uh, apparently, Clockwork Empires' videos are the only thing I do. If you're interested in purchasing this game, it has just recently, uh, like by recently I mean today, it has launched into open release from early access. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, you know, watch videos and uh, decide for yourselves. Maybe this is something you would enjoy playing. It's available for purchase on Steam. Uh, and all this time, I've been saying it's available in the Humble Store when it is not. It was available for early access purchase through the Humble Widget, which is not the same. Uh, although it's kind of linked to the same uh, backend. Anyway, if you're interested in this game, you can purchase it on Steam. Otherwise, uh, thanks very much for watching, and I hope you enjoy playing Clockwork Empires. I hope to see you back here soon.